All right, so is this right? All right, so uh, welcome to the 2020 annual meeting of Oceanside Conservation Trust. Um, it says it's the 39th annual meeting. We were founded in June of 1981, so maybe we didn't have a meeting the first year. So next year will be our 40th, so there's no doubt we'll have a big blowout party if, if we're all still alive at that point. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Roger Burley uh, of Cliff Island, uh, president of Oceanside Conservation Trust. I've been a member since, uh, a director since 1982. Uh, it's been a great ride, and uh, we have had so many wonderful board members and had so much fun doing some pretty darn wonderful stuff around the bay. And um, so, um, my, my fun has been working with uh, Oceanside's directors and members, and um, I think I've really only been president because I have a boat uh, <laughs> to get people to, uh, to the various meetings and, and tasks. Uh, but I don't care. If that's what it takes, I'm glad to have that excuse. Um, so I liked, I never get this right, but I'm going to introduce all the board members um, that I can think of. David Hirth from Cliff Island, Michael Johnson from Long Island, Bill Stouffer from Little Diamond, John Lordy from Long Island. Um, who am I missing? Is that it? We've got some former board members, We've got former directors, uh, Harry Pringle, uh, Priscilla Doucette, and uh, since I don't want to forget later on in the uh, workings of the meeting, I'd like Priscilla to come over here for a second. This is, this is you. <laughs> Priscilla has been a board member, a director of um, Oceanside, and she has also been the mother of a current director, Bill Needleman. And, she, and she's been an advisory <laughs> trustee, and she has been absolutely essential to the production, design, creation, minding of our newsletter, which is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Jane Laughlin and Hope McVeigh uh, Trey from Cliff are now trying to replace Priscilla, um, but they can't. But we can show our appreciation for Priscilla. You have been absolutely elemental to the fun we have and the work we do. So thank you, and Michael has something for you. <laughs> thank you so much, Priscilla. Priscilla doesn't like my letters because I capitalize things that I think should be capitalized, and she is an English teacher just like her husband, I think, and uh, says, no, no, no. And I say, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, we, we come to a middle ground most times. All right, so um, we are here to celebrate the, the great work of uh, the Little Diamond Island Association, um, some really foresighted people, some incredibly generous people in this community. Um, again, Judith Hills is not here right now? Not, not here. Okay, so um, many of you um, have contributed to this uh, project. We raised $300,000. We, Oceanside put in, what, about 9000 So we, we, we're a player, Oceanside is. Um, but the Little Diamond Island Association's membership and, uh, and the work that they did to, to raise... 291,000 of that total is absolutely phenomenal. And Bill Stouffer, uh, with his assistant Harry, um, certainly uh, elemental. It couldn't have happened without your, all your work. It's just terrific. So uh, we thank you. Oceanside thanks you. The whole of Little Diamond, I believe, thanks you. And the whole bay, because there's not going to be a McMansion right here. And a little later on, uh, the last, our last uh, piece of the agenda is a story um, that Harry will tell about this, the history of this property. 
So I am particularly looking forward to it. I heard a little preview from uh, uh, Jimmy Hackett a couple of years ago when we, when I first walked on this land. So um, I think I'm just about done. But again, thanks for coming. Thank you for what you have created here. And we're going to need stewards for this property. Or do we already have them? We do. Okay. Um, so I would like, uh, Bill, I'd like you to talk a little bit about this, and then I'd like you to give the treasurer's report. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have much to say about the lot except except um, thank you to a lot of you. Judy Hill's not here. There were a lot of people that kept pushing me. Harry was pushing me. Judy Hill would call me every once in a while, what's going on with those lots? Um, and and. I think I needed that because it, it at times was a little tough. My first call to the late David Putnam didn't go very far. And by calling him directly and bypassing the real estate broker, I had to then go back and repair that relationship with the real estate broker that I damaged. But um, thank you so much to everybody's generosity. I, I quite honestly I had many days where I did not think there was any chance we were going to raise this much money. And it just shows that I think we all recognize what's important to our island life, and, and that includes some beautiful land that's left untouched, except for the birds and the trees and all those Latin-like words you use to describe things on the report. So, and so thank you. We, yeah, we, we yeah. had you on the agenda for about 15 months, and every time we would get down to that part of the agenda, you'd... Yeah, I did, I did. I, <laughs> don't ask me that, Roger. Yeah, yeah, so. Anyway, thank you guys. You want me to? Yes, I do. Okay. So I'm going to read our financial report. Chris, Chris Stevenson's our treasurer. And he's yeah, I am substituting. To his kids. Oceanside Conservation Trust financial position continues to be strong due to the generosity of its members, conservative budgeting, efficient operations, and good returns on investment reserves. As we have stated in the past, OCT's strong financial position provides us the resources we need to maintain and defend its, 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 its lands, acquire new lands, and support our conservation efforts. We ended 2019 with a modest financial surplus due primarily to the organization's expenditures coming in under budget. In addition, the organization has benefited from great returns on the investment of its reserve funds and a very generous and supportive membership. As of the most recent bank and investment statements, we have a healthy investment account, which is invested in a mixture of stocks and bonds. Of these investments, $90,000 is restricted for stewardship and defense of our lands, as well as property management. The balance is held unrestricted for future activities, including future easements and land acquisitions. OCT has an annual budget for 2020, just over $42,000. This year, OCT is right where we want to be from a financial standpoint. Thank you for your continued support for making all this possible. Thank you. Bill and Chris Stevenson, by extension. And I don't know, John, you want to talk a little bit about John Lordy, um, about uh, what stewardship and defense is all about? Sure. Uh, well, stewardship is the easy part. We are charged with uh, ensuring that these lands remain natural as possible. And uh, some lands face more challenges than others. Uh, we're fortunate on this piece of property that there's very little invasive plants that are starting to take over the natural communities. Um, some of our other properties have uh, a much more robust population and going to require more management. But um, to kind of go through the life cycle of what is involved, we first do an inventory of the property, identify what's there, um, and as part of that, identify challenges that the property has, that in invasive species, maybe encroachment, uh, maybe illegal dumping, and then we take um, action to fix those things or come up with a, a plan to take care of them. Um, invasive species management 
typically occurs over a long period of time and and sometimes uh, it may occur long after none of us are here. <laughs> um, and we, we do annual monitoring to make sure that occurs and then we also encourage getting local stewards to help us uh, with that and typically the people who live uh, right near the property are the best stewards possible and they help us out with that. Um, the defense fund is set up so that if there are any issues or legal challenges regarding right title or interest or for some reason we are uh, sued, those monies are available to, uh, to help us manage that situation. If we're sued, yes, we also have sued people. Yeah. Uh, on Long Island, uh, way back in the 1980s, um, there was some serious cutting of land that, that we held an easement on. We didn't own it, we held the easement on it, um, looking, overlooking the passage, uh, the Hussey, between Long and Peaks. And so we were able to um, successfully sue the uh, trespass. Uh, um, and uh, so a, a conservation easement in, in its simplest form, first of all, it's a legal <laughs> instrument just like any other legal instrument. And it's in, uh, held in uh, registries uh, of the local, the appropriate municipality. What it, the working part of it, there's a lot of boilerplate language, but the working part of it is a list of things that are permitted on a piece of property and the list of things that are prohibited on that property. And that's what Oceanside does. Uh, usually every May, uh, we get out and about um, on and see all of our, I think it's 16, 17 properties around the bay, a few of which we own, most of which we hold conservation easement easements on. And we walk around and look for good stuff, look for bad stuff, look for fallen trees, look for um, brush piles that shouldn't be on our land. And uh, our first step is not to sue somebody, but to talk to them and just get them to understand. We're just another neighbor. Um, whether by easement or by ownership, and so we're looking to have good neighborly relations, not antagonistic, uh, lit litigious ones. So in 97.8% of the cases, that's the way it works. It, it works really well. So um, it's, it's pretty simple. We've been doing this uh, every year, like I said, for almost 40 years, and we hope to continue, whoever the directors are in the future. Um, it gets, in a way, it gets easier because we have a better conservation easements that get improved from time to time, and, it, and it's pretty simple. And But the best thing we do is to make it plain to the community, including the abutters, about who we are, what we expect, um, and what, we, what we're going to do about it. So anyway, so now um, we have some more business, so I would like John Lordy again to read the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting, which was on his Long Island. Oh, I don't have those. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> okay. I sent them to you. Oh, you did? What happened? Uh, there was a technical glitch. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, that was Dave Hurry. Oh, I, my fault. You did the oh. treasury. I, Dave. <laughs> Mea culpa, Dave Hirth from Cliff Island. There's no reflection on Cliff Island. No, I guess I never did. No. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Wait a minute. Gotta... I'm sorry. I didn't mean oh, to no scare problem. you. Okay. Let's see if I can uh, project. Hang, <laughs> project, compete well enough over the wind uh, and hang on to the mic and read my notes here. Uh, all at the same time. Um, the first thing that happened a, a year ago was that uh, three board members were re-elected. Um, they were Tom, Tom Berg, John Lordy, and Bill Needleman. Um, there were, we re-elected our uh, board officers, who were Roger Burley, president, John Spencer, vice president, Jan, Jan Laughlin, uh, Secretary and Chris Stevenson, Treasurer. Uh, Chris presented the Treasurer's report uh, and he said, kind of like what Bill just said, that the OCT remains in 
a substantially solid financial position with an appropriate balance of diversified equity and fixed income and cash balances, which are board reviewed on a quarterly schedule, you'll be happy to know, relieved to know. Um, Roger gave the uh, president's report in which he expressed great appreciation um, and acknowledged for the, the many years uh, of dedicated and thoughtful service of retiring board members, uh, Bob Bittenbender, Erno Bonebreaker, and, uh, and Jean Gulnick. Uh, prospective board members, uh, Tracy Ames from, from Shebeeg Island was introduced and voted into office. Um, Tom Berg introduced our speaker, who was Heather McCar McCargo of the Wild Seed Project. Uh, and OCT purchased and made available for distribution um, seed packets from uh, the Wild Seed Project. And refreshments were served. Um, thank you uh, for the Long Island Civic Association for their, for their housing for the meeting. And that's it. All right, so uh, I'm not doing this in precisely legal order, but I am going to suggest that if there are no objections to the treasurer's report, that I can declare it accepted. Here, here. Okay. And then um, I would like to uh, suggest that if there's no objections to the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting, I will consider it accepted. Done. Okay. So, uh, I will also mention that uh, Bill Needleman, a little Diamond Islander, um, Priscilla's son, um, would have been here, but if any of you are following the, the waterfront news in the city of Portland, the fish exchange is in deep trouble, and uh, he realized that he had to uh, be on task uh, on the waterfront. Uh, Bill has been incredible working on all waterfront issues for many, many, many years, and uh, so he's on task today uh, and wishes he were here instead, but he's there doing good work for the city of Portland, and I appreciate that completely. Um, so, and I also, I should have said at the beginning that while we're um, getting in my boat or on the bay lines to do our monitoring work, we rotate, we, we go to all the islands and also for our annual meetings, we rotate around the islands that have oceanside properties, whether again in, in fee ownership or by conservation easement. And so we get to be uh, on all these islands on a regular basis. And I think it was three years ago, we were here at the casino. Um, and uh, last year, Long Island, before that, Cliff Island. So it's great. Anyone who wants to come and join these meetings get to, gets to see, A, get a boat ride, and gets to see uh, inside another island community, which I think is a great benefit. All right, so moving along uh, towards Harry's talk, uh, I will ask John Lordy correctly this time uh, to uh, do the nominations and run the election. Okay, so uh, the current nominating committee report, there are... Uh, no board members planning to retire this year. Um, there are no prospective board members being nominated. However, there are a number of current board members who terms expire this year and are available for re-nomination. Uh, these include uh, Bill Stouffer, Heather McVeigh Trey, Michael Johnson, Hope, Hope, McVeigh. Hope yes, sorry, Hope McVeigh, uh, David Hirth, Jane Laughlin, and Roger. Um, I would like to make a motion to nominate all of these uh, people for another term. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any other business that members or board members uh, would like to bring up? Any questions, comments? Um, Now's the time. Yes. I have a yes. And that is, what's, the, what's the status of the historic dump over on the lower property? 
We are at, uh, you're talking about the toilets and do, do you own any of that, Paul? <laughs> Actually, we're, uh, we are planning probably this spring to organize a crew to get that all out of there. Um, and I think I've already talked to Nate on that a little bit, but yeah, we're, we are planning to get that. There's a few things up here too, but most of it's all down there. We just took another visit around there actually, so. Good question. Yeah, we all, that's right, that's right. Marty from the city is committed to helping. So. Any more troublemakers out there? <laughs> Phil, you got a. I didn't get your comment. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments um, or other business? All right. Well, we're done with the uh, painful part, and now we're going to hear uh, Harry. Okay, so my job is to tell you guys a little story because not only is this an amazing piece of land to conserve, but there's also a little history associated with it. And the story is really, I think, a story of America, and you'll see what I mean by the time I get to the end of it. So our story begins in 1818 when a young man by the name of Michael Healy emigrates to the United States, either from Ireland or perhaps from Canada, it's not clear. He makes his way to Georgia and uh, is very, very lucky because in Georgia he wins the land lottery and is given, essentially free of charge, almost 1,500 acres of prime Georgia forest. Now, the land lottery, of course, is a way of redistributing lands that belong to the Cherokee, but we'll move beyond that because in order to clear those lands, he had to get some slaves. And one of the first slaves that he acquired was a young lady by the name of Mary, Mary Eliza. She was 15 when he bought her. She was a mulatto, meaning she was mixed race. It's not clear if she was born in Georgia or in fact, was born in the Caribbean, but he bought her at the age of 15, and by the age of 16, she had borne him his first child. She would go on over the next 15 years or so to bear him a total of 10 children. The first child was a young boy by the name of James, James Healy. And because James was born to a slave, James was a slave. Michael, the father, couldn't marry Mary, but she became his common-law wife. All of his children's under, well, children under Georgia law were slaves and therefore could not be taught to read and write or be educated. Over time, Michael Healy, with his 1,500 acres cleared by his, at one point, up to 50 or 60 slaves, becomes a fairly wealthy landowner, and one by one, he decides that he needs to educate his children. Remember, his children, all being slaves, could not be educated in Georgia or in the South, and so he sends our young man, James, up to a school in New York, which was run by Quakers, uh, very um, uh, anti-slavery. He's educated there and then goes on to Holy Cross College, College, where he graduates number one in his class. He was a very bright young man. Number one in the very first graduating class of Holy Cross, and that would have been in 19, uh, 1849. So James graduates 1849. Not surprisingly, having spent four years at Holy Cross College, he decides he wants to become a Jesuit priest. To become a Jesuit priest at that point, he would have had to go to a seminary in Maryland. Maryland was a slave state. He would have been arrested had he gone to Maryland. So instead, he goes to a seminary in Montreal and ultimately to a seminary in Paris, France, where he is ordained in the year uh, 1855. By that time, uh, James was fluent in French. 
which would serve him well because he comes back to the United States as a parish, parish priest in Boston for a number of years. And then in the year 1875, he is ordained as the very, as the second Catholic bishop of the Archdiocese of Maine. At that point, the Archdiocese was uh, much bigger than it is now and included all of Maine and all of New Hampshire, or a good part of New Hampshire. And so James becomes the first African American to be ordained as a bishop in the Catholic Church and one of the first African American bishops in the country. Pretty historic. Remember that year, 1875, because in 1875, a lot was going on in terms of immigration and growth in the state of Maine and all of New England. There were Irish immigrants coming in, Irish Catholics immigrants coming in, many French Canadian Catholics coming down to work in the mills. And so over the 25 years that James is the Catholic Bishop of Portland, he built, listen to these numbers, 60 churches, 18 convents, and 18 parochial schools, an uncounted number of other ancillary societies. He is, in my judgment, and I, I read a lot about him. I'm, by the way, not a historian. I'm just a lawyer. So if I say anything that's wrong, it's not my fault. Um, and if there's something I don't know, there are people in the audience here. I've only been on Little Diamond for 35 years. People have been here all their lives, much more than 35 years. So they can answer questions you may have. But getting back to 1875, um, over the course of the next 25 years, I think of Bishop Healy as being as much a real estate developer as a pastor to his flock because of all the things he does, buying land and building churches seems to be among the most important. Now, 1875, Little Diamond Island was owned by the Milk and Deering heirs. They had owned the island for a long time. It was essentially used for tenant farming, some fish drying to supply markets in Portland. And the Deering heirs were starting to get tired of owning this island and having to deal with those problems. So in that year, 1875, they sold four acres of Little Diamond to the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Those four acres became the Rand property, ultimately the Coast Guard property, first part of Little Diamond to be sold. In 1880, the heirs decided that they would have the entire island surveyed. They cut it in half, roughly 33 acres over here on the west side, 33 acres here on the east side. The 33 acres on the west side uh, were sold to Elizabeth Smith, and she proceeded to build a bunch of uh, rental cottages, 16, in fact, on Cottage Row, which you, if you came from the ferry, you would have passed on the left and 15 of those cottages still survive, although many of them have been moved all around the island. In 1882, our friend Bishop Healy decides that this might be a good thing to get invested in, and so he buys the entire eastern side of the island, 33 acres, now owned by the uh, Bishop of Portland. He proceeds to build a summer orphanage for the Sisters of Mercy between, and if you go down the hill on your left towards the sandbar, you'll see the buildings that still exist. Um, and that orphanage is run by the Sisters of Mercy up into the summer orphanage, summer camp. It evolved into up into the 1980s. But he chose the best piece of that 33 acres as the spot to build his cottage. And that piece of land is right over there on the knoll behind that tree. And on that cottage, uh, it was at the time, probably the nicest cottage on the island. He spent most of his summers here between 1884 or so and 1900 when he passed away. And that cottage was really, in a way that's hard to imagine for us now, the center of the Catholic community's summer activities in Portland because there was a huge bishop's picnic that he would throw every year Hundreds, if not thousands of people on some occasions would come over to Little Diamond. There'd be a huge feed on the road on the way to the sandbar. Uh, Irish fiddlers, jigs, just an amazing sort of exuberant kind of experience. And all centered on that cottage. That lasts until 
the early 1900s, but in 1900 the bishop passes away and the house is still occupied by the successor bishop. But a funny thing happens in the fall of 1923. It's uh, the end of November and that cottage burns to the ground. By the way, I've only been able to find two pictures of that cottage, one from the uh, archives of the Catholic Diocese, where I would have spent several days in February had it not been closed to visitors because of uh, COVID, so I'll get in there at some point. The other picture actually uh, is owned by Phil Lee, and he has it here. It's an amazing shot where you can just barely see the cottage. But that cottage burns to the ground mysteriously, and the rumor on the island has always been that it was burned to the ground by the KKK and that the Ku Klux Klan burned that cottage. So is that true? I haven't been able to verify it, but let me tell you what I know about the KKK in 1923. It's a, it's a really sad part of Maine's history, but the KKK was really, really resurgent in the 1920s. It reached its height roughly between 1920 and 1923 because there were so few blacks in Maine, the KKK focused its hatred on Catholics, primarily recent immigrant Catholics, primarily Irish and also French Canadian. The King Kleagle, which is to say the, the chief recruiter of the Klan in the 1920s, was a gentleman by the name of Eugene Farnsworth. Eugene uh, had been a magician for a period of time. Uh, he was a carnival barker for a period of time. He was a very charismatic guy, and his job was to increase the visibility of the Ku Klux Klan. He did a bunch of statewide speaking tours. He held a lot of rallies all across the state, some of which attracted thousands of people. And at those rallies, you could join the Klan for only $10. Of that $10, Eugene Farnsworth got a cut. So he had a lot of reasons for increasing the influence of the Klan. The Klan bought a large estate in Portland, uh, the Rollins Estate, between Forest Avenue and Baxter Boulevard. In 1923, established its headquarters there. When it was opened, the newspaper reports that there were over 3,000 Klansmen that gathered to celebrate the opening of the uh, of the headquarters. The Klan was also very, very active in politics and its arrival in Maine really split the Maine Republican Party in two. The old guard of the Republican Party, uh, led by Governor Baxter, detested the Klan, but the Klan was determined to show that it had a lot of power, backed Governor Brewster as the governor in 1924. Eugene Farnsworth is reputed to have said, the Klan will elect, elect the next governor of the state of Maine. And sure enough, Governor Brewster was elected governor in 1924. By 1926, the KKK's influence was waning and the public began to turn against it. Farnsworth himself died in 1926. So the point of this story about the Klan is to say that at its very height in Maine, which is to say in 1923, and at the very time that the Klan was promising that it would elect the next governor of the state of Maine, this cottage burned down. Maybe a coincidence, maybe not. I spent um, some time talking to Herb Adams, uh, a historian about this. Many of you know Herb. And uh, we corresponded and Herb said, yeah, he'd heard the rumor too. Um, he didn't know if it was accurate or not, but and I wish I could imitate Herb's sort of stentorian voice, but what he left me with this thought, he said, Harry, legends do not grow in the dark. <laughs> he also added a postscript to this talk, which is pretty interesting. So remember the Klan headquarters and the 3,000 people who celebrated its opening? Well. That headquarters burned in the early 1930s. And according to Herb, the parallel legend is that when the call was put into the Portland Fire Department, 
to put out the fire, the fire department was exceedingly slow to respond, and as a result, it burned to the ground. The Portland Fire Department, of course, at that time, and actually to this day, was largely Irish Catholic. So that's my story. If I find out more, I'll let you know. But, but for right now, guys, I'm sticking to my story. Oh, hi, Leslie. Um, I am Roger Burley, president of Oceanside Conservation Trust. And this is a, a wonderful event yet again. Oceanside was uh, incorporated in June of 1981, and it's now 2020, so we're almost 40 years old. What we do is we act to preserve and conserve uh, special properties in Western Casco Bay. And we're right now on Little Diamond Island, where we have preserved properties before. We actually own some properties on Little Diamond in fee, but we also hold conservation easements on property that uh, the Little Diamond Island Association or other individual landowners, they still own them. And we own the what's called the development rights of those parcels, which means that there's a legal deed called a conservation easement, which uh, lists the activities which are permitted and prohibited uh, on these properties, whether we own them or whether we hold an easement. So today, uh, I am standing on the uh, perimeter of what we call the Putnam Lots, which was uh, of one of the Putnam Lots. There uh, are two that the Little Diamond Island Association was able to raise the money to purchase from the Putnam Family or Family Trust, I guess. And now they, uh, the $300,000, including some of which Oceanside put in, um, contributed to the purchase of these uh, properties, and we own them. Well, I'm Priscilla Doucette. I've lived on Little Diamond in the summers all my life, and uh, this lot and the abutting lots um, has been just part of our childhood. We, we grew up being able to have picnics and um, build hideouts and really love this view of, of the bay and thanks to the hard work of the islanders we were able to uh, purchase this and of course Oceanside. I've been involved with Oceanside for many many years and so uh, I think that the island is just so fortunate to have this become part of our heritage forever now and not just part of a few lucky people. And the people who own this this land always let the kids of the island come and play here? Or? Well, this was owned by the Sisters of Mercy. And so they didn't, um, it was given to them in the 1800s, and I think Harry Pringle will tell a bit more. For when the sisters were forced to sell the land, um, then it went into private hands. But this lot, fortunately, was never sold off and never built on. These other three were built on, but we've had wonderful new islanders on it. So now this is a great compromise. We have some of the land saved. My name is Harry Pringle, and I've been on Little, we've had a cottage on Little Diamond for 35 odd years, which makes me a newcomer. Um, and, but I've been involved in Oceanside and involved on land conservation on the island for quite a while now. This is an incredibly uh, important project, not only because it's incredible land that we're preserving forever but also because there's a historical tie because right up there through the woods on a on a knoll uh, was the site of Bishop Healy's cottage he was the uh, second Roman Catholic Bishop of Portland and the first African-American Bishop in the country and he built a cottage here in the 1880s um, and used it as a summer residence but also a place for the Catholic community in Southern Maine to come every August. It burned down after he died under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, at some point in 1923, the island legend has always been that it was burned down by the KKK, 
I haven't been able to verify that. Nobody has, to my knowledge, but uh, we're doing our best. And so stay tuned. We may have an answer for you at some point in the future. Um, is there any movement to have some kind of a memorial to this bishop who, you know, very unusual at that time in Maine to have, you know, the head of... Uh, Absolutely. In fact, in the entire United States. Um, we have thought about that. I'd like to know a little bit more about the circumstances under which the cottage was destroyed. And to do that, you need to spend some time in the, uh, in the archives of the Catholic Diocese, um, which I would have done in February had this pandemic uh, not come along and made that very hard. But somewhere in those archives, there are some clues as to how that cottage burned. So if we can find them, then we'll be able to actually put together a little historical plaque that will make some sense. But even if we can't, what you've got, I think, is not only a wonderful case of land conservation, but a piece of history in the middle of Casco Bay that people ought to know something about. My name is Bill Stoffer. Do you want me to just... I want you to just go, Bill. Go, yeah. <laughs> so why did we start this? this? First of all, can I just say how long a process this took? I called up the previous owner, David Putnam, who has since passed away. And I thought it was going to be easy. I thought he's an old guy. He's just going to donate these lots and we'd be done with it. But it wasn't that easy. Um, the lots were in trust. So we actually had to raise the money. And the price was, it was high at first. So the whole process took us about three years. And we had a lot of people thought, there's no way we're going to raise $300,000. Not only did we have to raise $300,000, but we had to get the sellers to agree to sell us both lots for $300,000. So uh, we did get that agreement. They gave us about six months. And um, then we went to Islanders, and, and the, the, the donations just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then we wouldn't get quite there, and somebody else would cook in a little bit more money. And so just the generosity these Islanders kind of blew me away. And we did have, we had a few naysayers saying, you know, wouldn't it be more cost effective if we want to save land to buy acreage, say, way up north somewhere? Right, you could probably get it for a lot less. This came out to about forty-seven thousand an acre, but I think we have to save land wherever we can find land to save. And when you look at the coast and the islands, there's not a lot of land left to save. And I know we often talk a lot about saving land and how it impacts human beings in our lives, but I'm of the mindset that we kind of, we're the caretakers of the globe and we kind of got to save this also for the birds and the trees and all the, the plants that only the scientists know what, what to call them, but yeah. So yeah. That's a beautiful story. And um, I think, you know, the generosity of the Islanders is just amazing. And, but it's their home. You're right, you're right, it is their home. And I also think that Part of it is having land that's left untouched, but also it's for future generations of kids that need a place to just go. Sometimes they're going to do bad things, but they need that freedom to, to get away, to just discover, to walk around not knowing the name of a plant or, or an animal, but just, just to discover, you know, what's out there. And if, if there's a home on every single lot, then they kind of lose that, you know? And that's the magic of the islands, and you don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose that magic of the islands. I mean, I go out to the other, whether it's like Cliff, where you guys are, and that that big bluff that overlooks Jewel Island. I mean, you you just it you you have to appreciate beautiful pieces of land like that. Yeah. And be thankful that, to the people who who either donate land or allow people to use it, as well as the people like. The generosity of this island with coming together so quickly yeah, and yeah. getting that money yeah. together. And this isn't even a year round island. These are correct, yeah. these are people who come here yeah. and, and have that great appreciation. Yeah. And it was a joint effort in other ways too, because I'm not a scientist like some of the other members of our board. And so to me it's a very subjective uh, when almost artistic when I look at land like this. 
but some of the like John Lordy from our board who who gave me a whole spreadsheet of the birds uh, that that exist on these lots he did an inventory and when you look at that and then you take a look at bird populations on uninhabited land versus inhabited land it's a huge difference sometimes exponential difference so there's a lot of other reasons just for the biodiversity that maintains if we if we take away that biodiversity then what do we really have on these islands, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm Jim Hackett. I'm a lifelong resident here, summer resident at Little Diamond Island. So this is my 77th summer here, and I hope to get a few more happy summers out of this. <laughs> Who knows? <clears throat> but growing up here as a kid, these woods were really a lot of fun for us. We would divide up as two little groups of kids into two tribes because, you know, Indian tribes, Native American tribes, and we would build little shelters and things over here in the woods. And then at the end of the season, what we would do is invite each other's tribe over and we would prepare a Native American meal out of anything that we could find here on the island. Dig clams, blueberries, raspberries, anything make muffins, make pies, had a lot, a lot of fun, very, very fond memories. And there are still some of us left in the clan, uh, one being Priscilla Doucette, uh, and I see Philip Lee over there, and I don't think Martha was old enough, Martha Mickles, but uh, fond, fond memories of growing up on Little Diamond here. So do you still get together with the old tribes? <clears throat> oh yes, still get together. Some of them are now missing, yep. Some of them have moved off the island, some have died. Uh, but we still get together and reminisce and really have fond, fond, fond memories of everything here. So being able to preserve this land means yes. you can continue that tradition. Exactly, I can continue the tradition. As a matter of fact, one of our, my tribes, had a little settlement, it was down in here somewhere, <laughs> and we would build little lean-tos and what have you, and probably had fires, which probably was very illegal, but uh, we did that anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, how wonderful. So this has given you a lot of joy. It has given me a great deal of joy, yes, yeah, to know that this is being preserved, and so much of the island has been preserved, thanks to others, too, yeah. And other little children like you are going to have those adventures with their own imagination. Yes, they certainly are. I have two grand nieces. Uh, they have already been over here and looked around, and I told them about my adventures as a kid and bringing up, uh, you know, other kids here and looking around and enjoying immensely Mother Nature, the forest, the woods, and everything that it has to offer. Yep.